Um, while we're letting any more trickle in, why don't we go ahead and I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Rob Locke. I am one of uh, many curriculum developers within Red Hat training. Uh, I started uh, teaching the RHCE program back a whole lot of, lot of years ago uh, as a contractor, primarily in the Manhattan area uh, in New York, and then a, a bit of traveling associated with that. Before Red Hat, I've done pretty much all the different training vendors that are out there. So did uh, stints with Cisco, before that uh, Computer Associates, uh, before that I really cut my teeth, I'll say, on NetWare. All right, if you remember that whole thing, yeah. <laughs> Way back when. Uh, nowadays I get to work out of my basement uh, with some equipment and <laughs> writing uh, the books and things that you see in our classes. Um, what this particular session amounts to is something that we call taste of training. So what we've done is we've taken a little excerpt from a course we have, Red Hat OpenStack Administration, uh, course code CL210. Uh, it is the one that's associated with a certification exam that we offer with regard to OpenStack. Uh, and so this is the course you would come to to prepare yourself for that particular exam. Uh, what else? Uh, one other housekeeping thing, I do want to give a whole lot of credit to our partner Dell, uh, who were nice enough to loan us the computers for today uh, and give all of us a chance to do some hands-on with, in this session, uh, installation of OpenStack and then later on this afternoon, we're going to start playing with Neutron uh, and do several things with the networking piece. So CL210, let me talk a little bit about the course for a moment. Uh, classically, the layout of the course, you know, you've got a number of units. This gives you sort of an overview as to what we're looking to accomplish in that course. Uh, day one, we've got our introduction, we talk a little architecture, we start reviewing all the different names of all the different components within OpenStack and try to remember which one's Cinder and which one's Heat and which one's Neutron and all that sort of stuff. Then we move into OpenStack installation and that's what we've extracted here for this session. Uh, we're going to take a look at two methods of installation in particular in this chapter. One is the use of Packstack, which is very appropriate if we are doing an all-in-one, sort of a, a demo installation. We want all of the components, the controller, the compute node, everything on a single physical box. And so we'll use Packstack to make that happen. So we'll go through that process first. The other tool that we have is Foreman. Uh, Foreman is more of a deployment environment. So we'll have to set up a form and master. We'll modify the configuration that we want to use and ultimately deploy. And then we'll start pushing the scripts out to a couple of, in our case, virtual machines. Um, there is a third way to install. For those of you that have played with OpenStack for a long time, you know there's the whole manual process, right? Install the packages by hand you know, modify some config files, run some scripts, you know, and, and get the thing going, do a whole bunch of typing uh, is what it boils down to. So we do that a little bit in this course too, all right, where you get a chance to take a look at that manual installation process if you want to have complete control over exactly which little pieces go where you want them to be. But then we go into the various components, uh, taking a look at what they're uh, providing for us uh, and how we can go through things. And then, of course, at the tail end, we have a comprehensive review. This is something we're doing in a lot of our courses, particularly those that have certification associated with them. Everybody wants that last minute practice Thursday afternoon before the exam on Friday. And so our goal in the comprehensive review, as the name implies, to sort of give us a chance to go through all of those elements together. So as I mentioned, you know, classically we'll go through, orient you to the classroom here. Um, on your systems, 
Oh, and that's wrong. All right. Um, your physical systems are called host X now instead of desktop X that we have here. Uh, but then we will have a number of VMs installed on each of them here. But this is trying to give you a little bit of ideas to some of the connections that are being made to the outside world. As I mentioned, we normally talk architecture. We're skipping over that because you've all seen this type of slide enough times already, and it's only day two. So where are we? We're into OpenStack installation. Now, what I did is I took the first section and the third section from this chapter. Normally, I have two and a half to three hours to do this unit. We only have an hour and a half. And I wanted to focus on the two installation processes. So the first section has us working with Packstack. The third section has us deploying with Foreman. What's in the middle is the use of the Horizon web interface. Uh, if you stay for some of the afternoon sessions, you might see a little bit of use of that Horizon web interface, but you'll also see some of the command line uh, deployment pieces too. So how do we go about installing uh, Red Hat OpenStack? Now again, I've shortcutted here about how to get on your machines and all that sort of stuff. Normally that's done in the introductions and things. So let's go ahead and sort of rapidly get you typing. Most of you are probably staring at a login prompt with one username on the screen named student. Anyone want to guess what the password is? Student, all right? So username student, password student. Red Hat would have been a good guess too, all right? We use that a lot. Um, once you're logged in, I'm assuming most of you can navigate a little bit. Um, there is a track point in the middle as one way to navigate on these laptops. There's also the track pad at the bottom if you prefer that. We left both of them active on these machines. So whichever combination you're most comfortable with. Uh, you know you can right click in the middle of the desktop to open up a terminal. You can also go up to the menus up above and I've been playing on RHEL 7 too much, so I don't even remember what, where it's hiding. But what I want you to do is I want you to open up a terminal. Now, to get into a particular virtual machine, I want you to notice at your terminal window your prompt. Your prompt is host, you know, username student, at host followed by a number. The number is very important because that's how we'll know that you're getting into your virtual machines and not someone else in the room, because you're all on the same network. Well, technically, no. You guys are on one network. You guys are on another network. We're doing a lot of downloading, and I was trying to segregate the traffic a little bit. All right, so you've got it open at a terminal prompt. We're just going to use SSH to get into our first server. So do an SSH space root at server, the word server, S-E-R-V-E-R, -E your number, dash A. Oh, I should have shortcut it. I always forget that's there. All right, if you don't like typing server, your number, dash A, you can type A, your number. That's another host name alias we have in there. Uh, password for that one? Red Hat. Red Hat. There you go. So I'm going to go ahead and do that too. Now, um, those of you that came up to a keyboard, you would have found there a bunch of paper. These are the practice exercises, the workshops that we're going to be going through here. All right, so we have two VMs that we're using. There's A, your number, and there's B, your number. We need to be very careful to keep straight which one's which. In the first case here with Packstack, I want to be doing it on A. All right, so I want you SSH into A. And in order for us to use Packstack to perform an installation, the very first thing we need to do is install the OpenStack-Packstack package. And so you'll see there in step one on the very first page, it says we're going to do a yum install-y. And it's OpenStack-Packstack. I did the dash Y because I don't like waiting around and having to answer yes later on. 
but this should go ahead and install the packages. Now please, please, please make sure you're on your virtual machine. Please do not be installing OpenStack-Packstack on Host X. All right, you need to be doing it on the virtual machine. Otherwise, it messes us up for the rest of the day. All right, we've got to reinstall your machine from scratch in the whopping 10 minutes we have in between sessions. So let's make sure you're on your VM. All right, so it's installed Packstack for me. Now, one of the things Packstack will do is for the machine that we're deploying to, we want to use SSH keys to be able to communicate with that device. And Packstack will very nicely deposit that SSH key for me. But I need to generate keys first. So how do I generate keys on Linux? SSH-keygen, beautiful. So that's what we're going to run here. SSH-keygen, as you see there in step two. Helps if I hit enter instead of shift. Um, ask me what file I'm going to save it to, just hit enter. Passphrase, we don't need no passphrases. So just hit enter. We're not concerned about security, we're just making this happen. So is it a true statement that you need pack stack password Well, it's, it's a flip of the coin. You know, do you want to keep entering the passphrase or do you want to enter the password? Yeah. yeah. Is that what it's up to now? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. So we went ahead and generated the key, all right, to make it easier to deploy this stuff. Now, Packstack as a command has already been installed for me. So let's take a look at the help for Packstack. So you'll see there in the third step, we're going to run Packstack minus H, pipe it to less. And what we'll see here are some of the options that are available with Packstack. Um, dash dash gen answer file, and then the name of the answer file we want to create. We have dash dash answer file. So the difference between the two of these is gen answer file will generate a template answer file. Actually, reading ahead, that's apparently what we're going to do in step four. And then we're going to edit that template and then we're going to apply our edited file using dash dash answer file. But you'll notice we have a, a bunch of other things. We've got install hosts where we can identify a set of hosts we want to do this out to quickly. We've got all in one, other options. But then everything that's inside that answer file also potentially has a corresponding global option we can set here. So we could either be creating a pack stack command that goes on for about 20 lines. All right. Or we can gen the answer file, edit that template, and then go ahead and apply it. So I like the second option. So let's go ahead and do pack stack dash dash gen answer file. And then the name we want to give that file. Uh, we're told to use root answers.txt. Output-wise, it doesn't generate much, but if I go ahead and vim, or vi, or I didn't install emacs, I apologize. I'm going to go ahead and edit root answers.txt. We can see, yes, it generated the file for me. And so we can go ahead and look to enter some things. Now. There are three keys, according to step five, that we want to manipulate, at least in our generic quickie at the moment. The first one is config SSH key. If yours is blank right now, as opposed to looking like mine, it means you didn't run SSH key gen. So it looks for an existing key, a public key to be able to put in here. If it doesn't exist, well, you did it as the wrong user, or you didn't do that step. Uh, further down, we want to do a search on NTP servers. So I'm just going to do a slash and then uppercase NTP to go ahead and search for that. Conveniently, that brings me down to the key config NTP servers. 
And I'll go ahead and add to this the IP address 172.25.0.254, which happens to be the instructor machine up front, which has been configured to be an NTP server for the classroom, so we can make sure our certificates and our times are all in sync. The second thing I want to look for is configuring Horizon SSL. So I'm going to search for Horizon, slash Horizon. I see the Horizon host, but then right below that there's Horizon SSL. And I'm going to change the N to a Y. Now what this says is that we're going to go ahead and for the Horizon service, configure it to answer to SSL connections. Since I'm going to be logging in with a username and password combination with, you know, potentially the keys to the kingdom of OpenStack, I probably don't want to be sending that username and password over the wire in gorgeous ASCII text, particularly when I'm doing it from some Starbucks cafe and over there wireless. So we'll go ahead and turn on SSL. Those are the only three changes we were looking to do here. And you'll see on the second page, we have sort of a little description of what each of those three keys were that we were manipulating. But in here, there are configuring each of the various components, which ones we want to enable, which ones we don't, and so on down the line. I'll go ahead and save this file, and we'll go ahead and kick off packstack dash dash answer file, and then the name of the file root answers.txt. We go ahead and hit return. Now, it's got to initially send the key into that VM, so we need to go ahead and type the password once. And remember, root's password was Red Hat. Now it's deposited that key, and the rest should be done without intervention. And we wait, because this is going to take a little while. I mean, think about what it's doing. It's uh, installing the packages of all the various OpenStack components. It's going ahead and applying scripts to each of those components based upon the values that we have in that answers file that we went through. And yes, there's a myriad of things you can change in there and manipulate. And the stuff, as you saw, had some nice comments next to each of those configuration parameters. So you can go through and sort of look at some of those on your own. Yeah? So the IP address is an all-in-one by default of me. So it's the machine we installed the OpenStack-Packstack to, the package. So it was my own IP. Because um, you'll see on mine it's 172.25.0.10 because I'm on A0. Yours will be 172.25. whatever your host number is, dot .10. That way we're using all the same images and we just pick up IPs as the uh, VMs boot. Now, further down, once the install is done, looking at your sheet here, what you'll see is that we have uh, various methods of verifying what services are running. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not a very patient man. Just ask my wife. So I'm going to leave that workshop for a moment. And I want you to flip a couple of pages ahead until you see the next practice header. And it should say, practice installing Foreman. So we're going to get ready to sort of do some things in parallel. Remember, I said there were two VMs. So in theory, I could be doing two things at once here. Hmm. Well, let me go back to my slides for a moment. What you saw here and what we are stepping our way through is the workshop of installing Red Hat OpenStack using PackStack. The section we sort of skipped over is using the Horizon web interface. So the idea is once the PackStack install is finished, we have this all-in-one configuration set up on server A. 
we can then use the horizon interface to go ahead and create a flavor, uh, go through and uh, ultimately set up an instance running in that all-in-one environment. And that's what we normally do in section two. So we create the tenant or project, the flavor. We create a user who just has a user role rather than an administrative role to the tenant. And then we create the instance in Horizon. So flipping ahead, I'm now moving into deploying with Foreman. We're going to take a look at doing this on server B. But warning, at the very top of this page, it says to do a lab reset VM. Well, don't do that, because Packstack's running over there. Leave it alone for a minute. All right, give it some time. We'll come back to it. I'll tell you when we need to do the reset. All right, so sort of skip over that for a moment. We're going to, oh, yeah, I had to add a step here. So in step one, you'll see that the prompt is server x-b. So we're going to go over to the B virtual machine here in a moment. And you've got this uh, big, long yum install command. Well, what my cohorts did to me last week is they decided that we shouldn't run on the version of OpenStack that the course was written for, which was the original RHEL OSP4. But they wanted us to update to async3 which was an updated version of RHEL OSP4. And it turns out that what's installed by default in RHEL 6.5, which is what we're doing this on, uh, the Augeus Libs is slightly outdated versus what is shipping uh, with OpenStack. So we need to just manually update that one package. And I blame Forrest. All right. So what I'm going to do is come up here. I'm going to leave this, you know, I need to leave this terminal open and running. So I'm just going to come up to file and open up another terminal. And from that other terminal, I'll ssh root at b my number to get onto that second VM. Password should also still be Red Hat. So the very first line there is really long. And so if you have a helper next to you, or if your helper's a better typer than you, all right, consider offering up the keyboard at the moment. And I can sometimes talk and type, but other times, do I? Oh, yeah. X eighty six sixty four dot RPM. Now, if you mistype the name of the package or something like that, uh, there won't be really much in the way of a harm or a foul. It'll just come back and go, can't find the package, at which point you up arrow and correct whatever the typo was somewhere in that line. In the real world, your RHEL 6.5 system would be subscribed, all right, to redhat.com and it would be getting its updates or have its updates available and a simple yum update all right, before installing Foreman would have been sufficient. Since we're not literally registered with redhat.com and sucking the life out of the wireless here, all right, we copied down the one package to go ahead and do this. So hopefully everybody got that update package installed. You'll see a little bit further down there in step one, another yum command, which has us installing OpenStack-Foreman-Installer, which sets up the Foreman master. 
and because I refuse to make Dan Walsh cry, we will also install Form and SE Linux. And you'll see it'll install, what is it, 146 packages. So this will take a few moments. Again, this is installing the Foreman master. So the picture in Foreman is not a install Packstack and install everything on the machine that I just installed Packstack on. Rather, this is a setting up a Foreman master where I can modify the configurations using a web interface, we'll see here in a moment, and then I can deploy out to other hosts. So it's in this one, we're going to have to know our IP addresses and where we're pushing stuff and all of those kinds of things as we go through this. All right, so these packages are installing. Let me hop over to A and see how that's going. So what's happening with A? Uh, looks like we've got MySQL, Cupid, Keystone, Glance, Cinder, all installed. Now we're starting to put some Nova stuff out there. All right, so it's progressing. We're getting there. Let's come back over to B for a moment. Yeah, question. So we are, yeah, so we are using uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux OpenStack Platform 4 Async 3. All right, which is the latest released at the moment. Within a couple of weeks, I heard our product manager say async 4 in another session. Uh, he said that's coming out in a couple of weeks. And we've announced the beta for 5. Sorry. Huh? So the names are the numbers. So 4 is Havana, 5 is Ice House. Okay. Um, I, did we announce the five beta? Maybe I'm telling you news before the guy out there is supposed to tell you the news. All right, but yeah, there's a five beta coming soon. All right. Um, and a lot of this stuff is sort of shifting with each one. For example, in Foreman here that we're working with, I'm working with async three. Async 3 does not include the HA scripts. So if you want to deploy uh, OpenStack in a highly available configuration with mostly active-active and a couple of services that are active-passive, all right, that's in Async 4. All right, so the videos we saw in another session from one of our product managers, uh, he was showing off async 4 and a highly available configuration possibility. Um, he wasn't doing it live like we're doing in here with 40 or 50 of us. Okay. All right. How am I doing? B still going. A still thinking. We're racing along. Yeah. Ah, so one of the things we do notice sometimes with Packstack is that it has some built-in timeouts. And sometimes those timeouts are sufficient to getting everything done, and sometimes they're not. Uh, if you get an error during the running of Packstack, the simplest solution is to hit up arrow and hit return again. Since many of the services are already configured, the timeout will hopefully not happen to you the second time. Okay, so if some of you are starting to see some of those errors, go ahead and switch over. Ooh, it looks like maybe I did too. Yep, woohoo, I get to play too, all right. I didn't have to do the SSH key again, so I already had that. 
So this will go through each of those services and things and we'll hopefully finish that one up here in a little bit. My guess would be is given the number of us that are all pulling from the instructor machine at the moment uh, across the network that this is probably extending our timeouts a little bit. This is a little larger than a normal class, all right, for us. Question in back, sir? Yeah. Hey, just a question about tax debt. Uh huh. Uh, say you want to fill in a few non standard parameters in Milton Mm hmm. So um, depending upon the parameters you're talking about, you may find them in the answers file. So what I would do is point you to the answer file to see about that. If it's not there, mm, no. Yeah, or, or do the base with Packstack and then tweak from there. Yeah, our, our general goal is really Packstack is more for that all-in-one proof of concept, you know, play with it in the lab. Foreman is more the deployment piece. And, you know, we'll see some other things coming in about true uh, uh, hardware deployment and, and that sort of stuff coming in uh, new versions of satellite, uh, for example, from our perspective. Looks like my packages on Foreman are just about done. And I can already see that my pack stack has gotten further. It's up to the finish the API Nova, now it's on to regular Nova. So that's looking promising. We're on a verifying here, so we'll continue on I think with Foreman. Looks like it's finishing up first. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's a little bit product question, but maybe you can answer. Hmm. Is Red Hat committed to development of Packstack, or Packstack will be stopped over time and everything will be thrown into the format? Um, for now, yes, we are committed. All right, we are continuing to suggest its use in the all-in-one, the sort of experimental phase. The longer term, I think, foreman and the scripts and such that apply with that as a deployment tool, I think is more of our focus. At least that's my interpretation of what I'm seeing. Longer term, can we, we can assume how much? Six months, nine months, 12 months? In, in an OpenStack development cycle, you know, next week? I, I, you know, I don't know. So, yeah, it's, um, you know, there, there's a lot of interesting things happening. But it all seems to be centered around form and scripting. Um, you know, so even the, the Stay Puff project that we've started working with uh, to help us integrate it into satellite, um, you know, some of the other projects that are out there that we're helping to contribute to along those lines. Um, I think we are gonna just a little bit of a wait and see, see which one we as a community, you know, all decide to get around. And, and continue forward, but at least from what I've seen, Foreman seems to be pretty central to most of them. All right, how am I doing? Ooh, hey, I got a word complete. That's a good sign. So hopefully most of you are getting close to uh, the Foreman packages finishing installing on B. Um, if you're still in the verifying stage, uh, it's not much that I'm jumping ahead here. Step two uh, on page 33 has us downloading some parameters. So I'm going to do a, a quick wget from instructor example.com slash pub slash materials. Oh, you know what? I don't remember if I did this in both sides of the room. Well, we'll find out here shortly. Well, no, no, it exists in both sides of the room, but there's a change here. You'll see in a moment. <laughs> um, do me a favor and um, cat the resulting file. We're just gonna do a room-wide double check here as to what I remembered to do earlier this morning. 
it should look like this. If you have a bunch of other lines, and so since I did this on this side of the room, I know you guys are good. The question is over here. <laughs> you got a few other lines. All right. So the other lines, get rid of them. They're useless now. They worked for the uh, original shipment that we had of OSP4, uh, OpenStack Platform 4, so our initial Havana release. Um, what we had were some shortcuts in the form and scripts that would work off of the private controller IP and the public controller IP and try to automatically populate the form and scripts and variables with some values. That's been done away with now in async 3. And so I remembered to remove the lines on this side of the room. I didn't remove them on this side of the room. So if you're on stage left, uh, edit the file, and you should only have form and gateway and form and provisioning as set to false. Now, what do these guys mean? Well, this boils down to whether or not we're looking to do actual provisioning, uh, so bare metal uh, provisioning. Since we're doing uh, VMs that are already installed with Linux, I'm not provisioning that system. So I don't need to install Linux first. So I don't want those services running because it just makes this whole process take longer. So we'll just go ahead and say false to both of those. Um, actually, it, it should ignore the parameters that are there. So if you were, uh, as long as you, yeah, no, it's not till the next one. Yeah. No, I think we're probably good. So what I need to do is I need to source the file that we've downloaded. And what that'll do is it'll set both of those environment variables for me. We're going to CD into user share OpenStack form and installer bin. And we're going to run foreman underscore, I always do a dash for some reason, uh, server.sh. And again, the goal here is to set up the foreman installer, the master, if you will. And so this is going to go off for a while and do some things. Now, what you'll notice is a little note on the back side of this page. The use of private controller IP and public controller IP in companion variables has been deprecated. What this means, if you're looking at some old documentation, is that you're going to have to modify certain default parameters, which is what we'll do in the last workshop is actually edit those parameters. So the controller uh, private host, the MySQL host, the Cupid host, and the controller public host. All right, so this will work for a little bit. Let's leave this one, and I think at this point we can go back to A. Now, hopefully, you should see some green duns at the top and some nice additional information. Mine says did not create a cinder volume group because one already existed, because we already have these on our systems. Um, one of the keys here is the mention of the file root keystone rc underscore admin. This is a file that we will be able to source that will create environment variables of the admin username and the admin password that was used by default by Packstack. We probably should have gone into the answers file and tweaked the password to something human memorizable and typable. We did not, all right? But I'm letting you know that that is a possibility, all right, if you were to do this in the future. So going back to that earlier exercise of installing with Packstack, what we have done is we have completed step six, which if you look at the bottom, it was page 19, if that helps. 
you know, since the stuff's not in binding, I lose track of my paper. So back on A, what I'd like to do is continue with step seven, where we're going to run OpenStack-Service status. And really what we're doing in the last couple of steps here is just showing several different ways for us to go ahead and see some status information. So when I do OpenStack-Service status, I see a bunch of the OpenStack services. We see Neutron up there. I see uh, Solometer, Cinder, Glance, some Nova uh, services. And we see the various ones that are running. So that's one way for us to check services. Another way for us to check some services is in step eight. But this one, I need some administrative privilege. And so the very first step in step eight, they have me catting the file that we're about to source, the Keystone RC admin. And what you can see here is the OpenStack username, uh, the OpenStack tenant name, and the OpenStack password. And so that was the password that was in the answers file. <laughs> so now you can break into my OpenStack. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to source this file. Now, one of the other things we'll notice from the Keystone RC admin is the very last line there was export PS1 to change my prompt. Because I want to know when the things that I'm typing have certain administrative privileges. For example, one of the things we normally do in CL210 is later on in the course, after we've created a user and we want to be doing things that don't require administrative privileges, we create a Keystone RC underscore user. And we source that file with the username and the password and then can go ahead and perform those operations by hand. So once I've sourced this file, I can now do Nova commands like Nova host dash list. And you'll see here it tells me which one is my console, my scheduler, my conductor, and my compute node is, again, the all-in-one configuration. It's all on A. Another one that might be of interest is to do a service list with Nova. And so this shows me similar information in just more columns. We see the status is enabled. We see that the state is up for each of those services. Another command I sort of like to dump my whole status is OpenStack-status. And so this is sort of a combination of the things that I've just done. It starts off listing for each of the services. Well, this is all scrolling off a little too quickly here. So let me scroll back up. Come on. There we go. There's my OpenStack dash status. So we see my Nova services. At some point, we probably should fix that dead to be inactive, particularly since it's disabled on boot. I mean, the, the dead thing scares me. So, but it's disabled on boot, so of course it's not running. Um, but there I see the other services that are currently active. Then it gives me a list of Keystone users that have been defined. And remember, we have a username for each service, and that's how the service registers. We'll see any uh, images that perhaps we've uploaded, which at this point we haven't yet, because this is a fresh install. But if we had uploaded some images, we'd see them there in Glance. We see my Nova managed hosts, just like the service list command we had done a few moments ago. Any Nova networks, well, we're not running Nova networks. Uh, there are my flavors, and then it ends with a list of any running instances at this point. So that gives you a little bit of a flavor of different ways we can go ahead and check the status of a now installed pack stack. So that's all good and happy and 
functional. So let's blow it away. So I'm going to exit from A0. Ooh. Forrest broke me. He left. <laughs> okay. um, well, I don't think this will work. But remember that lab reset VM command? Yeah, we need to do that. But I don't know if it works as a regular user. Let's try it. It will in a new classroom environment I just put together. Yeah, script must be run as root. So you all need to su dash on your host in order to reset. Um, the password on your host is not Red Hat. It's change me. I stole it from Foreman. So again, make sure you're on host X. And we're going to do a lab reset VM. Now, by default, lab reset VM will reset server A and none of the others. Because you know we've got the Foreman thing going on on B. So we don't need to pass an argument. But if we wanted to reset B, for example, we'd have to put server our number dash B. But in this case, I'm just going to hit return. This will destroy the virtual machine server 0 A and reset it. Say yes. Blow that puppy away. Goodbye, Packstack. And it's gone. All right. So that first workshop done over with, we saw how Packstack can be used to create a simple all-in-one installation just tweaking a couple of parameters in the answers file. All right. It generated a Keystone RC admin file for us so that we can have those administrative privileges to be able to do our various commands and continue to operate with that running OpenStack environment. So I'm flipping back over to B now. My catalog run has finished. So hopefully a few more moments. And we should wrap that one up. So again, this is the form and installer that we are putting into place at this point, the, the manager. Yeah. This is Havana. How can we tell? Yeah, it's if I do a, a yum list installed. Mm, wait for this guy to finish. But yeah, you'll look at the version numbers uh, of the OpenStack packages. If it's four, it's Havana. If it's five, it'll be Icehouse. Yeah, yum list installed will give you a list of the installed packages. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that there was some network uh, configuration, especially that we have. Just uh, elaborate on it. Like it's different now. Like it's bridge network. Uh, All the network stuff, Forrest is going to do okay. this afternoon. No I'm going to defer you and make you come back and listen to him. So. Um, but, but the general idea is the physical host for us right now is being bridged um, those interfaces to the VMs and using traditional Linux bridging at the moment. And so then any of the neutron configuration is all being done inside the VM at the moment. Ooh. Hey, mine's done. All right. How's yours going? Other folks getting the Foreman installer? Looking good? Progressing? Good. So I'm going to go on on page 34, which is back in our Foreman installer operation. I'm up to step five. Now, a couple of things I probably should point out. The output at the end of a lot of these scripts, useful information. <laughs> sort of gives us a prescriptive, hey, here's the next step as to things we should be doing. So what is this one telling me? Um, Foreman is installed and almost ready to use. Uh, we'll find Foreman if we point a browser 
at server B. The username is admin, and the default password is hmm, change me. Uh, so their suggestion is that you go specifically to that URL and immediately change the password. Well, that's step six here in a minute, so I'll get back to that in a second. Let me finish reading what's here. Once we've secured our form and installer, then there are some parameters that we probably want to be adjusting. Much like we edited the answers file for Packstack, there are some parameters that we need to change here. Now, in the older releases, and what you might see in some of the older documentation is that we could skip some of this because the public controller IP and the private controller IP auto-populated some values in there. And so I could do almost an all-in-one configuration without having to edit much of anything. But if you're going to do all-in-one, do it with Packstack. This one is more for multi-host configuration. There is a file that was placed in temp by this form and installer called form and client sh. And what we want to do is we want to copy this file. We'll do this in a, a few later steps. We're going to copy this file out to any client nodes that we're going to use and push scripts out to. So what form and client does is that it um, says hello to the form and installer, all right, and then the form and installer will now know about that host. And then you and I can put that host into what we call a host group. But we'll see how that goes here in a moment. So what I need to do is I need to open up a browser. So along the top here, I've got uh, Firefox. Let's go ahead and kick that one off. Of course, since this is the first time we're doing this, it's trying to phone home to Mozilla. Go ahead and close that little tab. And uh, in my remaining tab, I'm going to go to the website it suggested, which was server dash, or server my number dash b dot example dot com. Again, we're doing SSL here. This is an untrusted connection. Yeah, I didn't get this registered with any certificate authority. So traditional self-signed certificate that we just click on, I understand the risks, add the exception, confirm the security exception. That's what we've taught all our users to do, right? Anyway. So once I get past that, we'll do admin, and then again, the default password is change me for Foreman. No, don't remember my password. Now, the output from the Foreman installer gave us a specific URL we could go to to edit. Uh, let's go ahead and just sort of navigate to there. So we can come up here to uh, admin user, my account. And as I scroll down a little bit, we see a password field and a verify field. We're suggesting that you go ahead and put in Red Hat. I know, we're going from one secure password to another one. We'll put Red Hat in, and you need to fill it in for both password and for verify. Scroll down in your browser. Once you've filled those two in, and click on Submit. You'll see an upper bubble in the upper right hand corner that appears and disappears saying successfully updated admin. So we've gone through the process of changing the password for that admin account. So what does that get me up to now? The next page, which is around here somewhere. See what happens when it's not in a binder? Those are so out of order. Yes, page 36. So again, one of the other things that was mentioned there was the existence of a form and client sh file, which will then go ahead and register a remote host 
to this form and installer. So let's go ahead and back in my terminal window. Remember when we did the reset of A? Well, now I want to get back into A. So let's SSH back into A, our number. Remember to SSH in as root. And once we're on A, now what we're going to do is copy that form and client file over to this system. So there in step one, it says we're going to SCP root at server our number dash B colon slash temp foreman underscore client dot SH. And I need a target, so I'll just put slash root to copy it to root's home directory here on A. Remember, root at server B's password is Red Hat. And so you should see it successfully copying the file over to your local system. I'll just take a quick look at this. You'll see it's doing a yum install of Augeus and Puppet, all right, along with some other things, testing the agent, turning on the Puppet service. And so this goes ahead and gets us configured to be able to point to server B, you see there under Aug tool, which is the Puppet configurator. So let me quit out of that. It wants us, uh, we need the Augeus libs before we can install Augeus. So you remember that nasty yum install we did earlier on B? We get to do the same thing over here on A. L6 underscore 5.1 x86. <coughs> ah. Did I miss something? Grab the file, so I type it in, examining. The file's already updated. All right. That surprises me, but I'll go for it. We'll see if the foreman client just barfs. Uh, maybe somebody was already on A0 on me on this side of the house and did those steps. Which is why mine ran so quickly. So somebody's playing on my machine instead of their own. Remember, you're supposed to be on A, your number, not A0. Huh? Nah. I don't really care. It means less typing for me. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, oh, uh, need to mention to you, at the tail end there, you do see a warning 400 on server failed to find. And that's because this host doesn't yet exist in the database. Uh, it hasn't been assigned to a host group or anything like that in the form and installer yet. So this is one of those chicken and egg things, all right? We need to get the client saying hello to the installer before we can get the installer to start doing things with it. All right, so I am up to step two. And step two wants me to start playing with host groups. So, I'm going to do this the uh, easy way. 
Up at the top where I've got my HTTPS server0-b.example.com, I'm going to replace users with host groups. And it'll bring me over to the list of host groups. Um, if you don't like typing, uh, look under more. <laughs> That's where you'll find host groups. So what you see here are some um, standard scripts, uh, predefined sort of deployment scenarios. And so what we have are a controller and a compute depending upon the type of networking you want to do. So you see I've got a controller for Nova Network and a compute for Nova Network and then I have a controller for Neutron and a compute if I'm using the Neutron networking. Uh, we also have one to set up the Neutron networker. We have one for setting up different types of block storage, load balancing, and so on. So according to our lab, what we're going to do is we're going to play with the controller and the compute, assuming that we're going to use Neutron for networking. So in the first case here in step two, they want me to click on the controller Neutron link. This brings me into editing that set of scripts. I've got several tabs across the top here. We're going to go to parameters. Now this is sort of a, a curious web interface, I find. Um, is that a nice way to put it? So it gives me a list of all the parameters for this particular one. We've got the name and the corresponding value. But if I want to change anything, we've got a button over there on the right called Override. And when I first came in here, I clicked on Override and I expected I'd be able to enter something right there in value. And then I realized, oh, it's down at the bottom of the screen. So I did my first one. I clicked on Override. I went down to the bottom to change it and then clicked on Submit, and it kicked me all the way out to somewhere else. I'm like, no, I needed to do more. So here's the sort of game we now play. I have a list of five parameters I want to change, you see here in step two. What we're going to do is we're going to gradually scroll through the list, and we're going to click on Override of each of the five. Not putting in the values yet. Just click override to each of the five. So I find here admin password. I click on override and you see it puts a little line through the value. That's fine. Override button went away. That's fine too. Let's scroll a little further down and look for the next one. The next one they want me to change is controller priv hosts. So I got a, down a couple pages here. There's controller priv host and you'll see the default IP is 172.16.01. Well, that's not the IP address of my machines. We're in 172.25 networks, right? So uh, these are ones that I'm going to need to override. So we'll click on override of the private host, and we'll click override for the public host, too. And then scrolling a little further down, they say the next one we need to do here is the MySQL host. Oh, not quite. I'm almost there. There's MySQL host, which also has the 172.16.01. So the old private controller IP environment variable and public controller used to take care of these for me. Yeah. Anyway, uh, click on override for that one, MySQL. And then the last one we're doing is the Cupid host. So it's all the ones that basically had the IP address in them. So once I've clicked on override on each of the five, we'll go down to the bottom of the screen. And there I see the five of them happily sitting there with little boxes with fields to change. And so because I don't want big long passwords from admin, we're going to change this admin password to Red Hat. And this is where you want to be careful what you're typing. Make sure you match what's in your book. Now, 172.25, the private network, there's math involved, all right? And I, I hope you can handle this one. You remember your number. 
All right, you were, say, host 12. All right, so your number is 12. In the third octet, I need you to take your number 12 and add 100, making it 112. All right. I happen to have been zero, so my math is really easy. But please don't put 100, put yours. So that's private. So the private we put up in the hundreds subnets, and the publics we put down in the regular subnets. So you'll notice that for the public host here, it's 172.25, just your number, whatever your x is, dot 10 in the chart there on your page. The MySQL host we're going to do on the private side. So 172.25, 100 plus your number. Oops. So does that work well? Now, in the real world, one of the other ones you might be manipulating would be your tenant network type that we're using for Neutron. We're using the default GRE all right, for this sort of test installation. But if you wanted to use VLAN or you know, something else, you'd need to adjust that parameter up above and push it down here with override. But that's another common one a lot of people might be manipulating. All right, so I, I double check these, all match up with what I see there in my page. I'll click Submit, and it will have changed controller neutron for me. Step three, I need to do the same thing for compute neutron. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to deploy the controller out to server A. That's why it was dot 10. The compute, we're ultimately going to put on top of our foreman installer onto server B. All right, so again, we're using foreman here not for an all-in-one configuration, but for a distributed multiple configuration. So let's come over on Compute Neutron. We'll go over to Parameters. And again, we're going to play the same game. Click on Override to the ones we want to push down. So Admin Password gets pushed down. Now, interesting, we're pointing to the controller for all of these. So we're still using A's IP address. So controller priv host, controller pub host, the MySQL host, which is not as far down this time. Uh, here we want to identify the open vSwitch tunnel interface. So we'll click override there, because EM1 is not going to cut it. That don't exist. Cupid is the last one. So this time I've got six entries that we're tweaking. So as I'm down at the bottom of my host group parameters, we'll put red hat in for the password. 172.25, remember 100 plus our number, dot 10 for the private. And so we'll get all of these put in. The um, OVS tunnel interface is the interface we have in the VM, which is, in our case, ETH0. All right, so again, get it all to match what you see there in the table. And then go ahead and click Submit. So this is the basic process. We've gone ahead and we have um, defined some parameters here using this interface. So now what we want to do is we want to map the host group that we've just set the parameters for to a particular host. ETH0, it's on page 37, the back side.
So in step four, it says we're going to map the host group to our machine. So they want us to browse over to the hosts tab. So up top, I see dashboard hosts is the second thing there. And see, I've got two systems, A and B. So I'm going to go to, let's see, which one am I doing first? Um, so it says find the server A machine. So I click on my server A machine. I'm sorry, and uh, we're going to click on edit to edit that host. And you'll see at the moment my host group is blank. So I'm going to go ahead and choose controller neutron because I need the controller all right, before I do the compute. And we'll go ahead and click submit. Now, what this means is I've now scheduled a deployment to server A. And server A, since it's running Puppet, will periodically phone home to server B and go, hey, you got anything scheduled for me? So how much time you got? Yeah, not that much. So I'm going to go over to server A in step five. It mentions that by default, the puppet agent will only check every 30 minutes. Yeah, well, we're going to speed that puppy up. So I'm going to manually run the agent, puppet agent dash TV on A. Client already in progress. Yeah, somebody's doing this on my machine. So, huh? Um, yeah. So, all right, so that's off doing its thing. My agent is running. Once the controller is finished, we can go back to the form and dashboard, go back to host, and we'll deploy the compute neutron to server B. But we need the controller running first. All right, so we have to wait for this controller to finish. And this will take a few minutes. Uh, but then we can go ahead and pass along to uh, compute. Ultimately, we should be able, once the installation is done, we should be able to open the regular OpenStack dashboard to HTTP colon slash slash server our number dash A and be able to go ahead and uh, manage using Horizon and see those nodes in action. So I'm going to leave you all to finish up those last couple of steps, all right, which will go through and get your horizon pieces all running. Um, that wraps up this particular lab uh, that we're going to go ahead and do. So our goal here was to take a look at the installation processes for Red Hat Enterprise Linux OpenStack Platform 4, uh, which again matches Havana. We've seen the use of Packstack to create a quick and dirty all-in-one prototype. We've also seen how we can use the form and installer to go ahead and push these scripts, push this activity out to your different systems. Okay? So finish this up, and then I guess it's lunchtime, right? How'd I do? When was I supposed to finish? 12.45, and this will take another 10-ish minutes of deployment. So, ha. Yes, questions? <laughs> ah. Well, actually, you're on this side of the room, so you're doing it to that machine that I actually wasn't on. Mm -hmm. Oh, fascinating. All right, so, yeah. Right, so because the 0A, all right, is in the 0 subnet, so the third octet is 0 rather than 15. So that's why that was happening. So you have puppet agents then running on all of the... Virtual machines on your system, yes. Yes, by default, the puppet agents that we deploy here with form and client 
will be checking and phoning home every 30 minutes. Right, so um, we can redeploy um, uh, with Foreman and it can wait the 30 minutes or you can do like we are doing, the puppet agent dash TV because we don't have the patience to wait. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well all the ones that are there within the GUI, all right, within the installer GUI. So there are probably some things that are not mapped into Foreman at this stage. Right, if form, yes, it, it could revert some things on you, possibly. Yeah. So. All right. Yeah, question. No, step six can be skipped, but what step six is doing is verifying that your A is fully deployed because you're able to launch the Horizon web interface. So, and you need to make sure that you're fully deployed before you do step seven. So, yeah. Yes, so the pre-configured scripts that you see there for the host groups, you can be defining your own host groups, contributing them back to the Foreman project, you know, and that sort of stuff to extend all of this beyond, if you want to. Make sure if you're grabbing our stuff that you grab async four. Do very, very shortly. Okay, if you've got async four, then we will give you four predefined environments. Um, whether you're doing Nova or Neutron, whether you're doing HA or non-HA. All right, so those are the two different uh, configurations. Now, I will tell you that the HA scripts that we're providing are very prescriptive. It's a three node configuration, all right, for your controllers. Um, that I'm not 100% sure of. I know that many of the services are active-active configurations. A couple of the services are active-passive because they don't support active-active yet. For example, I know off the top of my head, Cupid does not support active-active configuration, at least what we have. So. so can we use right, so RHEL OpenStack platform is our productized version. Upstream of that is RDO, all right? So in RDO, which is, um, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but it's uh, openstack.redhat.com, all right? If you go there, or, or it's redhat.com slash openstack, one of those. But uh, if you go to RDO, um, we will have things there earlier. We have packages available there for both CentOS and Fedora. It depends on the version. So, you know, for example, I would expect RDO might have Icehouse packages before we productized it, because that's sort of how stuff gets tested, sort of like Fedora does for RHEL. You know, we new technologies tend to get introduced into Fedora first, and if they're deemed enterprise worthy, or we've got customers demanding them, all right, we find them moving into RHEL. No, no, this, these, this form and stuff is all appearing in RDO typically before it appears in RHEL. So, yeah. Deploy just Keystone. I don't know of a predefined script for doing just Keystone. Yeah, so again, what we've, what we've given you in the package are those prescriptive host groups. And so, uh, now, it's all open in there and, and you can see the stuff under the hood so you're more than welcome to write your own prescriptions and add your own host groups that might break that out if that's what you're interested in doing. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, uh, go ahead and finish this up as you see fit. Um, when you're done, just leave the machine on, leave it logged in, d d please don't close the lid or shut the machine down or any of that sort of stuff. Just leave it up and running. 
we have scripts that are going to go out and wipe all that you've just done and prepare for the next session on Neutron.